Welcome, 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 geeks and nerds, girls and boys, to a brand new edition of Geeks Me Radio, episode 262. Today we're joined by legendary comics creator, writer, editor, Tom DeFalco, talking all about his time at Marvel, the various characters he's created, some of his favorite story arcs, what he thinks about the current state of comics, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and more. Stand by. We're talking to you. And for those of you who might be finding us for the very first time, this might be your first episode of Geek Me Radio. Welcome to you. I'm your host, James Enstall. Each week on Geek Me Radio, we try to bring you a new and exciting guest or two from the world of pop culture, be it comic books, TVs, movies, or video games. If you are a longtime listener, thank you very much for coming back. Welcome back to you. And if you are hearing this, if you're a first-time listener, after you've listened, if you enjoy what you've heard, leave us a nice five-star review. That always helps us. If you're a long-time listener and you haven't yet had the chance, take this time. If you just hit pause, go leave us a five-star review on whatever platform you are listening to us on currently. All those reviews help us boost higher in search engine optimization, in rankings and ratings and things like that that are important for those of us who are trying to get our message out there and trying to be heard by a larger audience. So thank you to all of you for your help with that. And that being said, I know you want to hear from this man. Let's get into it. Right now we're talking with writer, editor, and creator Tom DeFalco, who has a litany of things he's created comic book titles he's worked on a 1990 ink pot award winner and he joins us now on the show tom how are you doing great i appreciate the time today it's uh you were in the heyday you were right when i started collecting marvel comics you were the guy basically running the show so it's there's a there's so many different things i want to discuss with you uh let's start out with the way you started, you became a writer. Was that something comic book writing, something you always kind of wanted to do? You knew you wanted to be connected to comic books. Well, I growing up, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. Uh, and I mainly a fiction writer. And, um, I, you know, tried my hand at a bunch of things while I was in college. I worked in a PR office, worked for a local newspaper, did, did, did some radio writing, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. I uh, I believe that if you're going to be a writer, you, you should be a writer. And a guy who does comic books, does short stories, does, you know, anything else. Th- those are, you know, all different arrows in your quiver. Sure, yeah. And then getting so, to work, you broke into it to, actually with Archie Comics. Um, started as an editorial assistant there. Uh, you were actually one of the ones who created the Archie Comics Digest series, which is one of their more popular series. You got to work while you're there on Scooby Doo, Josie and the Pussycats. Uh, was uh, was Archie one that you had read growing up, and that was kind of something you kind of gravitated towards, or was that the first job that was like, yes, I wanted to do this? <laughs> well, uh, when I was growing up, I I I was just in love with the medium. I I liked all, all the different comics. I read them all, the, the superheroes, the, you know, the uh, animation things, uh, hot stuff, Richie Rich, yeah. the Archie comic books. Yeah, you know, I read a little little bit of everything. Um, and, you know, when I graduated college, I, <laughs> I didn't understand that writers don't get jobs. Um, I thought I had to get a job. And I applied to, um, I, I applied all over. I applied to... You know, magazines I had choked, you know, sold stories to and and a bunch of other things. And I heard back from Archie Comics and uh, they offered me a job and I 
and I grabbed it. Do you keep up with the comic books after the fact? Like you worked on Archie for quite a while. Was is it something you you keep up with, or is it once you kind of leave a job, is it kind of something you put behind you and you move on to the next thing, or do you kind of still uh, read Archie occasionally, keep up with what he's doing? Well, uh, you know, I'm I, like I said, I'm a fan of the medium. There are certain guys whose stuff I, you know, I, I always loved. Uh, Harry Lucy and uh, Sam Schwartz are t- two artists who, whose work constantly slay, you know, slay me. And, you know, Frank Doyle, a, a great Archie writer, George Glatter, I, you know, so I, I still get the Archie digests um, and flip through them and, and find myself, you know, getting sucked in again and again. <laughs> um, in, in terms of writing assignments, if I was working on like a writing assignment, let, let's say Amazing Spider-Man. When I left Amazing Spider-Man, I, I didn't read Spider-Man for many years afterwards. Oh, okay. Um, because, and this will sound psychotic, but I had to get the voices out of my head. I get that. Sure. Yeah. You know, because, you know, all of the characters behaved in a certain way, spoke in a certain way. And that, since, you know, that's how I saw the characters. It wasn't necessarily how the next writer saw the characters. So to be fair to the next guys, I, I didn't look at stuff. I, I didn't look at the stuff. Uh, you know, as much as I could avoid it, I, I did. And with comic books being such a, uh, the movie and the TV, it's, it's like a golden age has sprung up. We were got, uh, TV shows about the flash arrow, Supergirl and Riverdale. While well, we're talking about Archie, uh, Riverdale and the CW, I would never have a million years thought that Archie would have a, not only a, a series, a TV series set currently, but the fact that it would have gone for three or four seasons. Have you, have you watched Riverdale? Do you have any thoughts on it as a previous Archie writer? Well, I, I saw the first first few episodes, and I realized, you know, that was not my vision of Archie. Yeah. Um, and um, Riverdale is is aimed for, I'm going to say, twenty something year olds, mm-hmm. which sadly I I no longer am. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and thought, you know, it's aimed for a different market, aimed for a different audience, and uh, it's doing quite well. So whatever they're doing is working. That's true. Yeah. And with, uh, again, you've worked on so many titles at Marvel too. We've seen, uh, all these Spider-Man movies come out with Tobey Maguire and uh, Tom Holland and Andrew Garfield and everything like that. As much as you have your fingers in the spider universe, do one of those actors resonate more with you? I know we don't want to bring the voices back in your head, but do, do one of those, <laughs> one of those sound like, or act like more like you hear Spidey in your head? Well, you know, th- um, when you're when you're dealing with actors, they make the material their own mm-hmm. as they should. Um, I think you know you know all three of those guys, um, you know, brought something to the character of Peter Parker. Uh, you know, some of the movies I like better than others, but you know, hey, they, you know, that's what makes horse races, right? Right. <laughs> so, I I think the you know, I I think overall they they've done a you know a pretty decent job with the Spider-Man movies. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, Tom Holland obviously is very much enjoying the role, as you can tell with all of his Instagram posts and everything like that. Um, you worked on Spider-Man for quite a while. The Amazing Spider-Man run you did was that uh, just again almost a Renaissance period. I think you were on there from issue two fifty two, right about when he got the black costume on through 285 and one of the things people always talk about is the resolution of the hobgoblin story uh roger stern had an idea in mind it was kind of uh, went in a couple different directions and then it wasn't fully resolved until i think after you had left the editorship and everything like that as well was there a conversation at some point where it was decided what was going to be on or was it once you and ron friends took over the book you guys were kind of going in your own direction or or kind of talk a little bit about from your perspective, how the whole hobgoblin identity and resolution came up. Well, um, when uh, Roger and I first, when Roger first introduced the hobgoblin, I was the editor of the book Mm -hmm. and we decided it was going to be a mystery. And, um, 
And Roger said he, he was going to keep it a secret, even from me, wow. the editor. And I, and, and I said to him, that works. <laughs> um, I, I have a, a little experience doing mysteries. So I thought, said, I'm, I'm going to keep a suspect list and I'm going to eliminate, you know, suspects as we move, move along. And then when the time comes to reveal, I'll tell you whether or not you got it right. <laughs> um, and then um, when Roger decided to leave the book and <laughs> to my surprise, uh, I was asked to write the book. Um, I, you know, called up Roger and he told me who he thought was the hobgoblin. The, uh, it was ultimately what he did. Uh, Roger King, you know, Roger Kingsley mm -hmm. and he, and it, Roger Kingsley and, you know, his twin brother sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, uh, I don't know if I want to do the evil twin thing. Uh, so Ron Friends and I had, had our discussions, and we were kind of moving in a different direction. Uh, and then uh, after we were taken off the book, uh, Peter David did, did something to resolve, resolve it. And then many, many years later, right, when I was editor-in-chief, Roger came to me and he said to me, I, you know, I had this idea for, for a, a limited series that will, you know, re reverse the Hobgoblin thing you know, bring it back to my, to his original idea. And, and at the time I said to him, Roger, too many years have passed. Let's forget it. <laughs> you know, too right. many years have passed. I, I've always had the, had the feeling um, that we should always move forward mm -hmm. and, 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 and shouldn't worry about the mistakes of the past. Instead of worrying about things in the past, let's go, go ahead and make new mistakes. Um, and then a bunch of years after that, Roger convinced an editor to, to let him do his, his uh, limited series. And he, you know, he got, he finally got his way. So good for Roger. And it's interesting too, the, the fact you bring up there, because retcons seem to be something that some fans love, some fans hate it. It divides fans just like anything else. But uh, so it sounds like, Ultimately, you're kind of against the idea of retconning things. We just kind of let things be and kind of take their course as they have the history and don't go back and try to change it. Yeah, my, my feeling is just keep moving forward. Yeah, because, you know, retcons are, they only work if you've read all the material. Right. And I've never taken it for granted that everybody's read all, all, all the material. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things, the big ones that has upset most people is the one more day storyline where Mephisto makes the deal, Mary Jane and Peter, their marriage never happened, everything just kind of that that whole thing vanished and it takes out that whole continuity and there's always fan petitions trying to get people to reverse the one more day thing. Do you have any any particular thoughts as it's fallen in that category of that eh, shouldn't have been retconned or now that it's part of history, just let it go forward and let's see where it goes? I really don't have an opinion on that that stuff and that material because I never bothered to read it. Okay. I I, I heard what they were going to do. I thought this is not not anything I'm interested in, so I just passed on. And all the stuff you did too with Spider Man, introducing three characters that you co created: the Rose, Black Fox, and Silver Sable. Uh, very popular characters, Black Fox constantly popping up. It, it's this, you can't help but root for him, even though he's this, you know, kind of <laughs> poor, out of shape thief trying to make that one last score. Uh, what was the inspiration behind that character? We'll pause right there, take our first commercial break, come back and continue our chat with editor, writer, Tom DeFalco. Please stand by. Whoa, Archie's here. Daddy's here. Veronica too. Hello everyone, this is Paul Souls, the voice of Spider-Man and Ermy the Misfit Elf, wanted to be a dentist on Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Coming to you on geek to me Radio, hope you enjoy, talk with you soon. Here comes the Spider-Man. And all the stuff you did too with Spider-Man, introducing three characters that you co-created, the Rose, Black Fox, and Silver Sable. 
uh, very popular characters. Black Fox constantly popping up. It, it's this you can't help but root for him, even though he's this, you know, kind of poor, out of shape thief trying to make that one last score. Uh, what was the inspiration behind that character? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I wish I could tell you at this stage of the game. I know that uh, a lot of the names, Black Fox, Silver Sable, Puma, um, came out of a, uh, a bunch of animal cards that I had. Um, and I, you know, I was reading these cards. They would suggest, uh, you know, certain animals, animal traits, that sort of things. And then I, you know, use them as the basis for characters. Um, you know, an, an old guy trying to make one last score. Um, <laughs> uh, I think in many regards, all of us are trying to make one last score. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> <laughs> And Silver Sable, I know, is another very popular character. Um, I, I put this out that I was talking to you, and we got some social media questions came in. Uh, one person obviously is a huge Silver Sable fan because their Twitter handle is at Silver X Sable. And she was wondering that Silver Sable was trained by ninjas, grew up, and even still is uh, training with them until today. She wanted to know what was the idea behind that. Was it an inspiration you had? Um was it based on anything else, like a certain thing, or was it the same thing with Black Fox? It's just there was an animal card, and you kind of just put together an origin based on that. Well, um, the, the ninja thing came came later. I I did not add that to the, to, to the mythos, um, but I believe that you know Silver was somebody who um, her father was hunting Nazi war criminals. She got into the family business, and and as a result, was trained. Um, to be, you know, uh, equipped to deal with with um, very vicious criminals, uh, and um, you know, I always thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and then you know, once, <laughs> you know, years ago, I thought we, we were, you know, we were done with Nazis. I didn't realize they were going <laughs> to come back into fashion again. Uh, it never. Thought, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I thought that uh, all right, you know, uh, what do you do when, when when you know you have a whole business, you know, based on hunting down you know war criminals? If there aren't any war criminals, who do you go after? And it, you know, insurance companies will be hiring people. You know, governments will be hiring people. And I thought, okay, so you know, you yeah, you, you have this whole mercenary group. And I, I like the idea that the, uh, the, the, you know, short, very pretty woman was the toughest one of the whole crew. Yeah, probably one of the better hand-to-hand -hand combatants in the Marvel Universe, right up there with like Shang-Chi and uh, the Iron Fist. She really can hold her own with everyone else. And then having her have that, that group behind her and hiring Spider-Man who needed the money, that was, that was a great, uh, great interaction between her and Spidey. Well, you know, <laughs> that's our job to create things. <laughs> and it kind of goes too with the whole, uh, the, the stuff you did throughout that led to the, uh, the clone saga. And I know a lot of people have seemed to be revisiting that with fresh eyes because I know at the time, and we had oh. Danny Fingeroth on the show, who was, I believe the book editor for Spider-Man at the time saying that, you know, Marvel in general, but Danny took some heat for it and everything else. But people have gone back, and it seems like it's remembered very fondly by people who I remember in the '90s, like, "Oh, this is you know people people saying it wasn't great." But I think people have softened to it, and it's kind of almost found a new love, especially with Ben Riley coming back now and the whole Scarlet Spider thing. At the time when you guys were doing the Clone Saga, what was there any idea that a it was not going to be? loved at the time but have you now that you've kind of seen the same thing i have i'm assuming fans enjoying it do you kind of feel justified or uh not vindicated i guess well see at the time we knew that fans were gonna that, that it would be a very polarizing story because comic book fans are a uh, a uh, superstitious lot <laughs> a cowardly and superstitious lot. And they claim that they want change, but they always hate change. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I can tell you a little story about, about the clone saga. Um, we just started it. It, it. 
maybe it run a month or so. I went to a comic book convention and was standing online to get my badge. And I gave my name and the guy behind the counter says, oh, you know, Tom DeFalco, oh, you're involved with the clone saga. I love the clone saga. And the guy next to him behind the table turns and says, I hate the clone saga. <laughs> and then within minutes, everybody behind the table is arguing about the clone saga. <laughs> And, you know, me, all I wanted was my badge so I could get into the convention. So right. I finally got my badge. As soon as I got my badge, I turned around and I realized that all of the professionals standing online behind me were all arguing about the clone saga. <laughs> and that's what you want when you're a writer. You want people talking about your material. Yeah. So at the time it was happening, I thought it was a very successful storyline. Some people liked it. Some people didn't like it. But, you know. That's the biz. And here it is over 30 years later and people are still talking about it. We must have done something right. I would agree. And like I said, Ben Riley, that, that Scarlet Spider costume is one of my favorite Spider-Man costumes anyway, uh, with the, the blue hoodie and the red shirt and everything like that. Um, it's a great character. And then carrying on with that, now it's found brand new life. We're seeing, uh, you know, like I said, Ben Riley's back and everything. So as you said, if, if it's still going 30 years later, you must have done something right. So kudos there. No, well, we're lucky. Guys. We're lucky people. And I find it interesting that uh, a lot of people associate you so closely with Spider-Man, but I feel like your run on Thor was a bigger run for more issues and everything like that. And you had a lot of impact on the character there creating Eric Masters and Thunderstrike and you bring in the new warriors in. Did you uh, ever find it odd that more people don't associate you with Thor as associate with you with Spider-Man? We're going to pause again, come back and continue our chat with editor, writer, Tom DeFalco. Please stand by. Hi, this is Neil Ross, the voice of a plethora of animation and game characters. One of them would be the Green Goblin and Spider-Man, who reminds you... You're listening to geek to me Radio! Welcome back to geek to me Radio. I want to make sure we take this time to let you know about our official movie sponsor, Marcus Theaters, Marcus Theaters and Movie Tavern. I'm so pleased to be partnered with this organization. Uh, when movies went away, the last movie I saw in theaters was Bloodshot. And I, as soon as I knew that was going to be my last movie, I didn't know what to do. But luckily, Marcus kept things going for us when we were quarantined, when we were in our lockdowns at home. They allowed you to order the giant bags of popcorn online, a couple of uh, king size candies, a drink cup they'd send along your way so you could fill it with the beverage of your choice at home. And it kind of made it feel like they were bringing the movies to you since you couldn't go to the movies. And I remember Labor Day weekend was when they opened up the Marcus Theaters here and I went and saw Tenet. I'll never forget those two movies. They kind of bookended quarantine for me and I missed the movie theaters so much. I was just there at a sneak preview of No Time to Die, the new James Bond movie this past Tuesday. Theater was packed. I loved seeing it. Everyone's out there for Tuesday because you get the free complimentary popcorn. You get $5 movies on Tuesdays at the Marcus Theaters and Movie Tavern location closest to you. They got a special deal right now for a Sunday passport. You sign up for that. You get four movies for $20. Sundays, September 12th through December 12th. And with that passport, you also get 20% off all food and drink in theater purchases only. Uh, they've got all sorts of movies out to see right now. No Time to Die uh, will be out soon. Venom, Let There Be Carnage is out now. I saw that one too. Not my favorite, but it was. It, it's always better to see it in the theater. And we saw No Time to Die in IMAX. And oh my gosh, that's the way to see this movie. This movie was filmed for an IMAX theater. But Dear Evan Hansen's out in theaters. Uh, Halloween Kills is coming up. Adam's Family 2, the animated. Uh, it's just, there's so many great movies out there. Get out and see it because if you missed movie theaters, Marcus Theaters is making it safe to get out and see movies again. Uh, masks are required where applicable. It's all based on the state guidelines or city guidelines where you are. And uh, they've got foot kickstands on the door so you can open the doors without touching. You can even download the Marcus Theaters app for a more contactless experience. Order your 
your uh, popcorn, your snow caps, your milk duds, your sodas, and it'll be ready and waiting for you when you get there again for a more contactless experience. And if you're still a little on the fence, do it. Do what I did a couple of times. Rent a private theater so you and twenty of your friends can sit in your own private theater and watch one of these movies that are out right now. Go to the website marcustheaters.com, find the movie tavern or the Marcus Theaters closest to you, and go from there. It's a great. Great time to see movies because there is no bad time to see movies, and Marcus Theaters makes it a great time. As we always say, it's the best movie-going experience in the galaxy. Once again, the website, MarcusTheaters.com. Very proud to have them as the official movie sponsor here on Geeks Me Radio. All right, enough about me. Tom DeFalco, we were talking with him right before the break, and we asked uh, about being associated more with Spider-Man than he was with Thor for as big of a Thor run as he had. You know, that's... To be honest, I don't know how people associate me, and I don't really pay attention to that. Uh, um, I, I, I think I had an even longer run on the Fantastic Four, and I certainly had an, an even longer run on Spider Girl. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it, you know, uh, I just hope that people like some of the stories I did, and uh, whatever they associate me with sounds good to me. Uh, you know, I, I will tell you that many times when I was editor in chief at Marvel, uh, people would associate me with things that I had absolutely nothing to do with. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I, I remember one time somebody started screaming at me because, you know, you know, why did Steve Ditko leave Marvel? <laughs> you know, leave Spider-Man. I said, I, I really don't know. I was in high school at the time. Right. <laughs> and, you know, and I said, and, and and besides, Steve is back at Marvel, so yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't know what to tell you. And you bring um, up the editor, and you were you were the tenth editor. You uh, were preceded by Jim Shooter. When you when you took on the editor position, was that something you lobbied for, like you wanted to be editor, or was that something that was kind of people asked, "Hey, would you please take over next?" How did you <laughs> becoming editor come about? Um, I. It's a it's a weird thing. Um, I was Jim Shooter's second in command, and I could tell that the company was getting ready to make a change. And I just always assumed that when they made the change, they would get rid of Shooter and me. Okay. And in point of fact, I was getting ready to leave the comic book industry. Oh wow! <laughs> um, and you know, it was actually you know, in the process of negotiating with an animation studio. Um, because I, I, I thought, you know, uh, you know, things are not going to work out at Marvel. I tried to convince Shooter to come with me. Um, he was convinced Marvel was never going to fire him. I was convinced that, that it was, you know, it was only a matter of days before they fired us both. <laughs> and, uh, I was probably the most surprised guy in creation when they told me that they, you know, wanted me to take over for shooter. Um, and at the time they did, I thought, uh, you know, I, I, I thought I was, <laughs> I was basically in the process of getting ready to move to California. Huh? Um, I'd already put my house up for sale and everything else. Wow. Um, and then the animation studio, when they heard that, <laughs> That, that Marvel had gotten rid of um, Shooter, they withdrew their they withdrew their offer. Huh? Because um, they said to me, I remember the guy saying to me, "There's no way we can compete with Marvel." <laughs> and I remember saying, y "Yes, you can," because <laughs> because uh, they were offering me a lot more money than Marvel did. But, uh -huh. but you know. Life has a way of working out. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting to think about where things would have gone had you just had decided. Because obviously, it sounds like you almost had one foot out the door, ready to take the other one out. But uh, who knows what would have happened if you'd not? All the stories we wouldn't have gotten, uh, the characters that wouldn't been created. Which brings up uh, another thing: what if your work on what if you did a couple of issues for Volume One, and then you had a pretty good run on Volume Two, including creating Spider Girl. Uh, when you're doing the what if titles, I'm often interested. Do you, as a writer, 
pitch ideas and then occasionally, hey, we, you know, we're going to go with this one? Or are you assigned ideas and then you have to kind of flesh out what happens? Um, sometimes a little of both. Uh, I, I think I suggested to, to uh, my editor at the time that the, the, the um, Spider-Girl idea uh, and the Thor idea, you know, and a couple of the others, I think he suggested a couple of the X-Men ideas to me. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's strange when we go back because Spider-Girl was only meant to be a one shot. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my regular assignment was what if all I was thinking of in those days was coming up with, with what I thought were, you know, cool. What if ideas, mm -hmm. it never occurred to me that, um, that, you know, there would be a second Spider Girl story. Not, um, yeah, not only a second story, but man, it was an ongoing series. She popped up for quite a while. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, she's of all the Marvel superheroines, she had, I think, the longest ongoing book when you take all of the, her appearances into consideration. Uh, I, I know at the time she did, you know, I have no idea where, where, where she ranks now. Yeah, we, we did Spider Girl for like 13 years. Yeah. It uh, <laughs> it was a surprise to us all. And also speaking of the heroines, you started the Dazzler series, which I, I read that entire issue, you know, one to 42, love the series. So again, was that an idea that kind of people had said, hey, we're going to do a Dazzler series, who wants it? And you volunteered to write it? Or did you say, hey, why don't we give Dazzler her own series? We're going to pause again, take another quick commercial break, come back and continue our chat with... Marvel Comics editor, writer, creator Tom DeFalco, please stand by. Spider Man and his amazing friends. Hey, this is Yuri Lowenthal, but you may know me recently as Peter Parker slash Spider Man, and you're listening to Geek to Me Radio. And we're back. geek to me Radio, the premier sponsor, which makes the show possible, is, of course, historic St. Charles, the Greater St. Charles Convention and Visitors Bureau. Their website, which you should go look at because they just redid it and it's gorgeous. The website, discoverstcharles.com. That's discover, S-T, not saint spelled out, just stcharles.com. What an incredible place, and we're so lucky to have it right here virtually in our own backyard. And I, I know a lot of you are listening. You might be not in the greater St. Louis, St. Charles area. That's okay. Come visit. It's a great place to visit uh, with people, more people getting vaccinated, uh, more things opening back up. We're seeing the world start to come back, and there's no better place to explore than St. Charles. If you've been planning a trip and you don't know where to go, maybe you're like, ah, we need to go somewhere Oh my gosh, St. Charles, and this is the best time of year to go. There's their upcoming Legends and Lanterns Festival, which makes me giddy. Uh, if you're a Halloween fan like I am, if the, if the fall season makes you entirely happy, you are going to be even happier if you come experience it in St. Charles with uh, their Legends and Lanterns Festival, which brings Halloween to life. It's a family-friendly event, and it's free. You can interact with characters like Baron Samity. Uh, they've got the Weird Sisters from Macbeth. All sorts of fantastical creations and creatures for you to interact with and talk to. Uh, it, it's a great time. There's vendors going on down there. This is a, a place made up of small businesses, and these small businesses all chip in to help make these festivals possible. It's a just a great atmosphere, and if you've never experienced it, you owe it to yourself to come check it out. If you're in the greater St. Louis area, you really have no excuse. I expect to see you in St. Charles during Halloween, or if not, at least for Christmas time for their Christmas Traditions Festival, the longest running and largest Christmas festival in the country. Make sure you check that out. Start with the website to plan your trip, whether you're near or far. DiscoverStCharles.com has all the details you can find on uh, the events, where to stay, what to do while you're there, et cetera, et cetera. So I recommend that as your launch pad for your adventure. DiscoverStCharles.com, as we always say, it's an historically good time. Chatting with Tom DeFalco, and before we took that last break, we we're asking Tom about uh, one of my favorite books, the Dazzler series. I read all 42 issues of that. Um, he wrote, I think, the first seven or eight, if I'm not mistaken, but I asked him how he ended up starting Dazzler's solo book. Well, no, uh, 
Dazzler was originally um, a, a, a movie company, a record company, and a comic book company uh, got together, and they they were going to create this character, Dazzler, that was going to, uh, you know, sing on records, uh, make concert appearance, and, and appear in movies. And I, I think that I, I was it, told. Um, Hired to develop the character, I think it was because I had worked at at Archie, um, had worked on uh, you know on the Archies, uh, was was familiar with the Eureka Company, mm-hmm. having worked with uh, Don. Uh, what was Don's last name? <laughs> uh, who, who did the Archies? Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and uh, I think that's why they they asked me to develop the character. I re- remember at one point they said to me that, uh, uh, they, you know, they were talking to Bo Derek about being the Dazzler and appearing in a movie. And they said her powers are she can, um, she's so beautiful that, that she makes people tell the truth. And I, and I thought, oh, man, that's a lousy power for comic books. <laughs> and, and I remember the record guy looked at me and says, OK, wise guy, what do you think her power should be? I said. Dazzler should have something to do with light, and and the, the record guy, the movie guy, look at each other like this is some brilliant idea. <laughs> I mean, you, you put a thousand comic book guys in a room and say the character's name is Dazzler. What's her power? I'm sure 999 of them are going to say <laughs> light. <laughs> um, and then you know, off to the races. And the solo books you've worked on, obviously a great run on Machine Man. Uh, one of the ones I loved so much was the Green Goblin series with Phil Urich. That was oh. a brilliant series. And I know uh, we had another person, another Twitter user, um, ask why that one got cut short. It seems like that would have that could have been ongoing. Were you were you given like a finite series, like we're only going to do it for thirteen issues, so you kind of knew where you wanted the ending to go? Or was it a sales thing and they decided, hey, we're going to can it after issue 13? How did the ending of that come about? Um, the ending came about because the, you know, the, the editor in chief at that time, Bob Harris, decided he wanted to bring back the green, the original Green Goblin as a villain. Ah. And, um, you know, we... We were looking at, you know, at the sales of, of the book, and the sales were doing very, you know, pretty good. They, they weren't, you know, they weren't great, but they were doing pretty good. And and, and um, I said, you, you're going to cancel a, a a title that makes money because you want to bring back a, you know, an old villain. That, and he goes, well, yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, what? What fun is it to be editor in chief? You can't make some bad decisions every <laughs> once in a while. I know I made a lot of bad ones. It was up to him now to make bad ones. <laughs> yeah, but that that it was such a fun book and such it was very fresh. There wasn't much out there like it. Uh this kind of, you know, trying to reform this it wasn't even the villain was reformed. It's he discovers Green Goblin stash and he decides, "Hey, I'm going to use this to become a superhero." And then people recognizing him as a villain and he's trying to fight that in a way it kind of mirrored a little bit of early Spider-Man where people thought he was a bad guy and was trying to do the right thing. So it, it was nice that little parallel there as well, but it seems like you had a great deal of fun writing the book though. I, I really enjoyed it. I, I was having a, I was having a grand old time for myself. And it, had it gone on longer? Was there uh was there an end game? Like, was there somewhere you kind of wanted him to go, but didn't get the chance because it was cut short? Um, I don't, I don't think I had a different end game. Um, you know, whenever I was working on a series, I always had, you know, notebooks of possible story ideas and that sort of stuff. And then when I got off the series, uh, I take all my notebooks and toss them in the garbage. Oh, wow. Oh no. Cause I, I didn't want to be distracted by them. And I, I know a lot of guys say, you know, Oh, I had this idea for this character. And then I, I, you know, I, I recycled it for this character and that sort of, I never had that attitude. My attitude was always, you know, I, 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 I want to start fresh. I, I want to, 
come up with new ideas. I, I, I often think that ideas are the cheapest thing in this business. It's all in the way you execute the ideas. Yeah, that's actually, that makes a lot of sense. And with the uh, being so closely associated with some of these characters, you famously wrote the uh, Dorling Kinserly, the DK Ultimate Guides to Spider-Man <laughs> Fantastic Four Avengers. Uh, another Twitter user, uh, I believe it's at Ian TN Volume 2, asked, uh, it's been so long since the Spider-Man one came out. Is there any thought about you doing a new Ultimate Guide to Spider-Man, or is that not something you'd even want to tackle? Uh, um... I, I'm, I'm sure that they, they, they must have come out with new, new, ver, new versions uh, since since I did those books. Um, I, I kind of did them, did the first one just because, um, <laughs> an editor, Ralph Macchio, had recommended me for the books. And, uh, and I, uh, I, I, I remember saying to Ralph, why? Why recommend me for this kind of this kind of assignment? And he says, "Well, you're the only guy I know who writes books." <laughs> and I said, yeah, "It was, you know, different kinds of books." Yeah. Uh, and I said, uh, "You know, th th that stuff is fiction. I made it up as I go along. This, <laughs> you know, this is this, this is research and stuff." And he said, "Well, you know, you can give it to your uh, your, your nephews." I had a bunch of young nephews at the time, and I thought. You know what? I've never done a book like this. Let me let me try it. And I um, you know, I, I was working on the Spider Man about halfway through it. I I I really understood the way to the way to way to write it. And then they asked me to do a second one, and and I thought, oh, let me see if I got you know if I if I have it right now. Um, and and then they, they conned me to do a couple more. Um. It, it was, you know, I do I do assignments for three, one of three reasons. I do it for love, um, you know, because I just love the characters and just, you know, want to run and, you know, write about them. Mm -hmm. or, or I do it for money because, uh, you know, sometimes people offer you a lot of money to do things. Right. And or I do it because there's a challenge. It's got to be one of those three things. Okay. As as time has gone on, right now, <laughs> right now it tends to be one of two things. It's either love, love or a challenge. <laughs> yeah. You know? Right. The other one's kind of fallen by the wayside, I guess. Yeah, money. You know, as you get older, money becomes less important. And talking about money, the comic book business is is huge with all the stuff we're seeing on the big screen and the small. Uh, when you go out, is there any particular Marvel movie or TV series? We've gotten WandaVision and now What If is currently running on Disney+. Plus. Uh, do you keep up with them all? Do you, do you try to keep up with them all? Is, do you have a favorite or a particular portrayal of an actor or actress in a role that you've really thought nailed it, knocked it out of the park? And we're going to pause right there. We're going to hold because I kept on talking with Tom. It was too much to put into just one show. So you're going to have to come back next week for part two. And if you come back next week for part two, I've got a special bonus at the end of Tom's interview with a few other famous writers from comic books who you might know. Uh, that'll be revealed next week. So if you enjoyed this episode, thank you very much for listening. Please come back next week for Tom DeFalco part two with special bonus guests. Thank you as always to Joey V for making this show sound as good as it does. And for putting up with me week after week, uh, he makes what I do easy. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be able to do it. So if you see Joey V, give him a follow on Twitter. I'm always, uh, he's always liking my stuff and I'm, I'm liking his stuff. So if you see him pop up there on Twitter, give him a follow because the man works hard and I appreciate everything he does. Very talented guy with his photography and his audio stuff and his video stuff. The guy is multi-talented and uh, I, I guarantee the show would not be going right now without Joey V. So thank you to him. Thank you to Tom DeFalco for your time. And of course, we'll get more from Tom next week. Until then, my friends. It's not in the way you watch I sound be. It's not in the way you watch the flash. It's not in the way you love Scotty Young Art. It's not in the way you play Mario Kart. It's not in the
Thank you, Empire State University. Good night. Hey, kids. Are your parents about to buy you a shiny new toy from Amazon? Hi, I'm Chucky. Want to play? Well, don't be selfish. Share some of that money with us. Before going on Amazon, make sure to type in bit.ly slash geek to me in the web browser. It will look just like Amazon.com, except it'll say referral geek to me radio up top. And then when you check out, a tiny percentage will go to support the show without costing you one cent more. So before your parents get you that gizmo, gadget, or widget, make sure they type in bit.ly slash geek to me in the web browser. Bit.ly slash geek to me. Bit.ly slash geek to me.